So you're you're at this stage. You're working with Core Labs. You're starting to notice some of these yeah. connecting some dots between various things, um, various industries like the poultry industry and what's happening to the environment. Um, at what point do you begin to look at your diet and behaviors and, and the things that you're eating? Well, that, that started early, actually, um, because I used to caddy for Jack LaLanne as a young teen. And uh, he was my hero. I mean, he was larger than life. Hollywood star, famous TV show. I mean, <laughs> and it was always in a foursome. And the other three people were all famous. Um, and he was the nicest guy, just the nicest guy you could imagine. But he would lecture me on nutrition <laughs> because that's who Jack was. And so at the 11th hole, yeah, I would caddy for him and one other guy who, who was um, uh, Rick Barry, who was a star on the Warriors and became the NBA's uh, most viable player as they won the national championship and all that. He was 6'7", Jack was 5'6". Jack was muscular, Rick was skinny. And uh, I don't know how many times I caddied for him, but a lot of times. And Rick would never talk to me, but Jack would. And when we get to the 11th hole, there's the, cat, the, the golfers are supposed to buy their caddies the treat of their choice. And of course, the treat of our choice was a Baby Ruth bar, a Butterfinger bar, a Reese's peanut butter cups, or something like that. That's a Baby Ruth bar. Oh, it's a it's a chocolate nougat nuts. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> and they were five cents, but they were these big, long, wonderful bars. And I had a sweet tooth. Um, and they were easy to shoplift when I was on the street. So, um, you know, so I had neural adaptation plus 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 for Baby Ruth bars. Um, any, very famous candy in America. So anyway, Jack would say raisins or peanuts. That's all he would get me. And raisins were disgusting in, at that age. So I got the peanuts. <laughs> I always got the peanuts. And the other caddies didn't want a caddy for Jack because they wanted the treats at the 11th hole. Because back then, you know, parents didn't allow, didn't indulge their kids that much. It was a different cultural time. So you didn't get much candy. You got a little bit. But, um, and he would say things. I mean, he had it dialed. In, in the 60s, he had this dialed. He would say, Chris, if it comes from a cow or a pig, don't eat it. Where was he getting that from? I don't know. Um, well, his mom was Seventh-day Adventist. Okay. Adventist. So, uh, and I'm assuming Ansel Keys was out with his popular books. And some of the scientific advisors to Jack at the time were at Loma Linda University and other places too. But but um, a lot of his friends were, were Adventists. And um, so... Um, he would eat poultry, he would eat egg whites, he would eat fish, but he would say, I want you to eat 10 vegetables and five fruits every day. It's like, what? And the thing that always got to me is, um, you won't miss it, you know, with the, with the meat, with beef and pork. And it's like, like, heck, I won't miss it. My dad is, you know, huge beef eater. Yeah, he's got heart disease and a big stomach and all that kind of stuff. But he grills almost every night. You know, we'd have sirloins and I mean, every night it was steak and potatoes and sour cream and butter. And uh, no wonder he died of a heart attack at 70. Um, and his heart disease became bad enough that I had to mow the lawn because his cardiologist said it would strain his heart and so on. So I would tell dad what Jack was saying. And dad would say, yeah, but he's a gym rat. You know, he's not a doctor. And I would tell that to Jack and Jack would say, well, I became, I was going to become a doctor, but I decided to do this for prevention to, you know, stop people from having to go to the doctor when it's too late. And, uh, uh, and my dad would say these other low carb dieters that he was following, Dr. Carlton Frederick's low carb diet published in 1965, super popular. He was, he would get 10,000 letters a week because he was a radio star. And that book sold, I don't know how many copies. The Doctor's Weight Loss. This was Erwin um, uh, Maxwell Stillman's. This one in the early 60s it already had 4 million copies sold. Medically proven. Medically proven, <laughs> yeah. Medically proven, low carb. And these were just building on the, the diets that had been popular in the 50s and 30s and 40s. In fact, I somewhere I have here my grandparents' book of health from the 30s, um, and it was a low-carb diet because carbohydrates caused fermentation. So, and my grandparents were overweight, you know, quite overweight. Um, and I, I lived with my grandfather till he 
till I was seven. And I know why he was overweight, <laughs> because our normal, his normal breakfast was white bread, which was we all loved Wonder Bread, white bread, and he would slather it with butter and sprinkle sugar on it, white sugar on it, and cinnamon, and that was breakfast. <laughs> so, you know, ultra pro he was eating ultra processed food basically, but he was doing the processing. Right. And that's what I was eating for breakfast too. And I was getting fat too. Mm -hmm. So you're catting, it was John, wasn't it? Who you were catting for? Jack. Lovely. Jack. <clears throat> and his, he starts to rub off on you a bit in terms you, of. You must be Australian because he was so famous in America. <laughs> um, this guy, Jack LaLanne. Okay. Have you ever done Jack jumping jacks? Yes. That's, that's him. Jack. Okay. Jack and this is quite the library that you've got. How do you get all of these books? <laughs> oh, you know, I've collected a lot of them over the years. I inherited a few of them like this one. Um, but I like rare old books and I buy them from booksellers and off eBay and, you know, places like that. It's amazing mm -hmm. to see how these diets are just still around today. They, they, yeah. they, they take on perhaps a slightly new name or, or new twist. Yeah, well, I have a story about that if if I'm not telling too many stories. No, we, we uh, love the stories here. <laughs> so, um, oh, here's a very popular carnivore diet book from 1880. Um, Dr. John Salisbury popularized the carnivore diet. And, you know, she was pretty famous. Elma Stewart was pretty famous. And she wrote this book that had multiple printings on the carnivore diet. And it Oh, it was popular for, I don't know, 40 years. It's been popular many times in history. I think uh, even Teddy Roosevelt was a big fan of it, and he died when he was 60 of thrombosis. What kind of evidence are they citing in that kind uh, of book? It was an anecdotal evidence, but it was experiments that John Salisbury did on himself and on, um, he would have people come visit him for a while and feed him just beef. Um, he thought fiber was the killer because of fermentation. So he tried to... The Salisbury steak, which he's named after him, uh, is a high-end hamburger, but it basically tries to remove the fibrous tissues that would create, turn into sugar and create, you know, fermentation. And um, so, but it was, you know, mainly anecdotal evidence, even though he was a pretty good scientist. Um, but he, he would just bring in people and, and feed them for six weeks, you know. Was he in your how long to health influences yeah. Live. He lived to 82, which is oh. about as I could only ever find anybody who was a high meat eater who uh, made it in their early 80s. That's as far as I could find. And I searched and searched and searched. This episode is proudly brought to you by Inside Tracker. Track your blood biomarkers, understand your biological age, and receive personalized lifestyle tips backed by evidence to optimize your health. To get started with Inside Tracker today and get 20% off your first purchase, head to insidetracker.com forward slash Simon. That's insidetracker.com forward slash Simon for 20% off. Yeah, maybe give us the, the, <clears throat> the top line takeaways from that series. What were the main themes, I guess, that you noticed? Yeah, so the main themes were, there were about, um, that series was about health influencers who'd written books and had become quite influential in the industry. So there are about a hundred of them that I studied. And um, and I wanted to know how long did they live? And it turns out uh, they went all the way up to 111. There's a Chinese nutrition scientist, 111 years old. I read this book. <laughs> I used Google Translate <laughs> to, to read that book. It's kind of boring. Be optimistic, eat a plant dominant diet. Don't eat too fast, walk after you eat, eat with people. Okay, I just summarized the whole book for you. Um, and Japanese diet, but this guy lived to 105. Same same message, but he's Japanese. Um, so we had people who lived all the way up to 114. Um, and uh, quite, Ansel Keys lived to 100. The, the core members of his team, uh, Jerry Stamler lived to 102. Ansel lived to 100, and uh, Henry Blackburn's doing really well now at 97. So their diet didn't kill them. <laughs> um, and um, so anyway, I studied these people on how long they lived. Um, and, um, you know, there were vegans who lived to 104. Uh, well, 
vegetarian for half his life and then vegan for the second half of his life. Uh, there was the vegetarian strongman who lived to 104, but he only he swam in the ocean every third day and he walked five miles every morning. And the only reason he died at 104, uh, eating almost exclusively plants, was that he got run over by a car. You know, so um, so basically, I tried to you know it's 100 people. It's it's not a scientific survey, but it, but it's interesting. And uh, so I would. Uh, look at how much education. So on, on the first one, I noticed that list of people who made it to 100 or more, um, they were all very highly educated and they were all plant dominant. Um, didn't have to be totally plants. In fact, they could eat a little bit of red meat. One of the, the one who lived to 114, she was a pediatrician who practiced till she was 102. And she um, she would eat two ounces of beef every other day, something like that. So Dose response, a small amount was fine, didn't seem to make any difference. Um, but the ones who ate a lot of beef and saturated fat and so on, you know, there were bodybuilders who died at 57, you know, or younger. Um, you, you had um, Bob Harper have his major heart attack when he's 40, uh, 52 on a low carb diet. And then Dean Ornish got a hold of him and he, he wrote this book called Super Carbs because he converted over to Super Carbs, but it didn't sell because nobody wants to eat Super Carbs. They want to see that if you if you eat liver, you become like the liver king and you can have ab implants too. <laughs> so yeah, it's, uh, it's the wild, wild west out there. Yeah. So the main things were education, happiness, um, sense of purpose, mm -hmm. uh, and um, plant dominant diets. Plant dominant. Which brings me to something that was said uh, last weekend. I went to Stanford's health conference symposium, and um, I had never heard of uh, the first scientist who spoke to us, Deborah. Um, mm, I can't remember her last name. It starts with K. Um, she's a gerontologist, uh, especially in osteoporosis. And uh, she was asked at the end of her speech, which was riveting. Everybody loved it. It's going to be online. Uh, what's the single most important thing you could do? And I expected, oh, is she going to say lean into plants? Because that was kind of the theme of the conference. Eat at least 75% of your calories from whole plants. Uh, lean into plants, exercise, she might say that, happiness. Um, but she didn't say any of those things. She said sense of purpose. Mm. That's the number one thing for her. So I thought, hmm, okay. It was quite fascinating. I feel like you've found a good, clear yeah. sense of purpose with yeah. what you're doing now with plant chompers. Yeah, definitely. You feel that? I do. And I w didn't do it for a selfish reason, for sense of purpose for my own, because I could have been very happy doing YouTubes on photography. <laughs> Maybe even, I mean, it's more fun. You get to fly a drone and you get to do ice climbing and all that kind of stuff and really fantastic photography stuff. And you get nothing but accolades in the comments section and you get millions of views. <laughs> I mean, what's not to love about it? And it boosts my the, the businesses that my kids now run. So I have financial interest in it. But I decided to do this. And you've, you're you very well versed at the rage comments you get. And, you know, <laughs> and I don't get as many views. The carnivores get all the views. Um, and uh, But I still love doing it, even though I don't get to do all the fun things. Um, I still love doing it. And it does give me a sense of purpose. And I feel like it's just so much more important than anything else I could do because it's your friends and family and population health, people's health. It's making a more livable earth. It's the unimaginable cruelty we're inflicting on animals that could be reduced. So yeah, it's my sense of purpose and I'm going to stick with it for the rest of my life, however long that is. Are you familiar with the term ikigai? Uh, and it's been a while. It's a Japanese word that essentially is used to describe one's purpose hmm. you know um the japanese tend not to think about retirement hmm. because what they're doing they're doing they they love what they're doing it's usually beneficial for their community don't retire that was one of his <laughs> leading commandments in this japanese book don't retire right. 